Uh, Mayor LaGuardia was during the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II. And he was called by adoring New Yorkers the Little Flower because he was only five feet four and always wore a carnation in his lapel. He was a colorful character who used to ride on the New York City fire trucks, raid speakeasies with the police department, take entire orphanages to baseball games. And whenever the New York newspapers were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids. One bitterly cold night in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at night court that served the poorest ward of the city. And LaGuardia dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her. Her daughter was sick and her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, the man told the mayor. She's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the wooden woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions, $10 or 10 days in jail. But even as he pronounced sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill and tossed it into the famous sombrero, saying, Here is the $10 fine which I now remit, and furthermore, I am going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. So the following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Fifty cents of that amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner, while some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York City policemen, each of whom had just paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. So what we're talking about here today is grace. He showed grace on that woman. He knew she couldn't come up with the $10. He, he, so you know what? He not only paid her fine, but he collected money so that she wouldn't have to seal no more. And that's the, that's the definition of grace. Just as Jesus Christ not only paid the fine of sin for us, but then he, he empowered us to be able to live better lives. That's grace. There's the saving grace. That, that provides that, that escape from the, the wages of sin, as it says in the Bible. But then there's the grace that continues to change us, making us look more and more like the Father. So today we're going to be talking about grace and the law and what that looks like. And of course, when you're talking about this topic, we've always got to go to old Paul in, in Romans. And because Paul's dealing with the Romans and he wants them to understand about grace and the law. Because it's an important topic. I want to, so we're going to start with Romans 6, 15 through 18. And what's cool about Romans is that I could have picked from very many different places in it because almost the whole chapter is about the diff, or the whole book is about the difference between grace and the law. And so we start out here with Romans 6, 15 through 18. It says, well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were a slave of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery of sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. I fa I, one, of my, one of the best illustrations I ever heard about this is, is my old worship pastor at Eastern. He said he took his kids out to a playground. And, and, and he said the, the kids, he told them that there's a shadow of building, and, and in that shadow was many playground equipment. It was all kinds of playground equipment. I know I've told this story before, but it's such a great illustration of what that grace would look like. And, and, and he told his kids, he said, you can play on any piece of playground equipment in the shadow of this building. And, and he thought, well, they, you know, there's a lot there. You know, they'd have plenty of things to do. But you know what the kids went? Do you know where the kids were? They went to the edge of that shadow, looking at all the equipment that they couldn't play with. Just staring at it. So instead of having a good time, they were worried about the things that they couldn't do, more than the things that they could do. 
And so often that's what we see in the body of Christ. They don't recognize the grace that they've been given. That the, the things that are outside of the shadow of God are things that can entrap us. Things where we can get hurt. And, and they'll spend all their time staring at all those things that they believe that they can't do. Focused in on how everybody else is have, it seems to be having fun but them. And they don't realize that there's so many things that are inside the shadow of God's grace that they can participate in. That's what we're talking about today, about grace. We're going to start off with the story of Jesus, so from Jesus' life. Where a woman was outside of the shadow of his grace. She was, she was doing things out on the playground equipment that's outside the shadow of grace. And, 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 and Jesus has to go and he brings her back into the shadow of his grace. Of the grace that he was preaching of the Father. And, and this comes out of John 8. Very familiar scriptures here with us. So we're just going to try to take this fairly quickly. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. So, so what do you have here? You, let's, let's just pause here for a second. So Jesus is teaching the words of life at the temple. The people who were jealous of him decided they wanted to sidetrack everything. They wanted to bring someone in that, to sidetrack what he was doing. They said, yeah, we know you're speaking, but this has to be done now. You ever notice that? How when you can be doing something great and something big, someone always tries to interrupt you because they don't like the fact that you're doing something great. There, we know that there was a big crowd here and the Pharisees pushed their ways to the front bringing this woman, dragging this woman out in front of them and said, this has to be dealt with now. I know you're teaching, but this, this can't wait. This has to be dealt with now. And, and they were seeking to trap him. They, they, wanted, they, wanted to, they wanted to see what Jesus would say because there, there are certain laws that they had to follow. Let's read on. The law of Moses says to Stoner, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. How are they going to trap him? Well, well, what we find out is that the Romans had to enforce their own law. When they came in as the conquering nation, they, they had their own laws. And they didn't just let you kill people for religious reasons. They, 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 they came up with, the, they had their own sense of justice. They're one of the first senses of, like a, a court and sense of justice that we have recorded. And, and they just didn't let you, someone couldn't just die in the street. They had to go before a Roman person before you could kill them. And, and so Jewish law said that adulterers have to be stoned. And, and there was a consortium of the temple of the Pharisees and, 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 and who were used to being the law before the Romans came and they're saying by our law she has to be stoned but they knew that if Jesus gave the word they could blame it on Jesus that he was he killed someone without talking to the Romans but Jesus figured it out and he, he does something that I wish most Christians would do learn to keep your mouth shut Instead of attacking people for their beliefs, get quiet and think before you open your mouth. I don't know if many of you are on social media or Facebook, or maybe you watch the news, but you notice that there's a lot of loud voices out there yelling at each other. What if we to took a moment to pause before we attacked? And he sat down and he wrote. We don't know what he wrote, and we talked about this before. No one knows what he wrote, and there's all kinds of speculation on things that he could be doing in the dust. Or he may have just been piddling, you know, showing that this really, he wasn't really as interested in this, and he was pretty upset about being interrupted as he was trying to teach people the words of life. Let's read some more. 
says they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the first one who hasn't, uh, let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. Do you notice this? He wasn't, he wasn't looking for confrontation. He wasn't doing this in defiance. He, he, he stood up. He gave his answer about who should stone her. And then he sat back down and put his head down to show that I'm not here for a confrontation. And people started thinking, of course. And what's it say next? It says that when the accusers heard this, or, or if you kept track, that's the Pharisees and the Levites that are accusing her, or it could be the Sadducees, the other religious faction. When they heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So all of the Pharisees started getting away because Jesus had suddenly touched a nerve. They, they suddenly, you know, they, they made a big thing about proclaiming that no one was perfect. They made a big thing about when, when they would go to get their sins cleansed, they made a big show of it. So, so everybody knew that each of them had done some sin. Of course, they never admitted to any of the major ones. It was always like, well, I was a few pennies short of my tithe this today. Oh, mea culpa, mea culpa. But they knew who they were. And they couldn't stand in the face of that question. So they had to leave. And only Jesus was left in the, in the middle of the original crowd that was there to hear him speak with the woman. And Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is grace. This is grace. They asked Jesus to judge her. And he said that we're all guilty. He said, every one of you are guilty. And he said, and if you feel that you have the right to stone her, go ahead and throw your stone. And everybody realized that they were just as guilty as her in some way. It's just that hers were on the display. Her sins were on display. And we could use this story to grind many axes. But, I, but an important thing about this message is that there was grace. This day, uh, today, I know that in Sunday school class, they talked about the, the, um, the woman that was, uh, I'm not, I'm, my mind's going blank, Gentile. The Gentile woman that came up for prayer for her, her uh, child. And, and, and once again, we see Jesus' grace. He first w wanted to know why she would come to him. You know, she wanted to, he, he, he kind of probed her on that. And even maybe, even tried to see if she would get angry if he talked about the differences between the two of them. But what was most important in her life was that her child would be healed. And, and she, and, and even when he acted like he wouldn't do it, she said, but even the dogs eat from the table where the scraps fall. And, and, and Jesus looks at her and he says, go your way and your child is healed. Grace. Grace. He, had, he was full of grace. And, and what a concept. Because this is flipping the Jews' view up on, or their, their view, it's on its lid. Because they don't understand this. They, they had taken and they had perfected this religion thing until they had a society that had hundreds of rules and, and, and they were constantly looking out to make sure that not a single rule was broke. They, they were constantly on the search to make sure that not a single rule, all in the name of being righteous. And then Jesus comes and he starts talking to them and said, why have you made this ent our entire faith about rules? He said, what about God? We've ruled him right out of our, our religion. The very one that we want to serve, we've ruled him out. We, we've, we've put rules in place of our God and, and, and forgotten grace and mercy. Because that's who God is. He is grace. 
And, and <laughs> the amazing thing is, is that they couldn't see it. We move now to a psalm of David. And David, in the Old Testament, could see the grace and mercy of God. The part that they would forget about 400, or what is it, 800 years later? 800 years later, they would forget about this grace and mercy. And David wrote about this grace and mercy. He said, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with an unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins, and he does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. Next. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. David recognized that the Lord was merciful in his situation. He knew that he had been forgiven of so much. And how did David come upon this revelation? Well, David spent time with God. God wasn't a far off concept or, or, or the one that put his family in terrain. David personally knew him. He had spent his time seeking out the Lord. And maybe knew him even better than most of the New Testament uh, people. He understood that God wasn't some far off being looking to smite people, but that he, he loved people. He came close. That's why it always hurt him whenever he realized he had committed sin. And, and, and even when he was to be judged one time, he said, it is better to fall in the hands of God than the hands of man because he believed that God just judged rightly. God would not, uh, would not uh, punish him beyond what he deserved. And that's why, we, why this grace is so important. That's why, it, that's why it is so important, because God does have grace. Where people would condemn, God has grace. When we talked about the prodigal son, Jesus tried to teach about that. The older son tried to condemn the younger son. He, he didn't understand why we were celebrating this person that had rejected him, that je rejected the father. And, 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 and he was upset because a feast was being planned for him. And that's when the father tells him about grace. He's alive. Let's celebrate life. I didn't know if my son was dead. Today I found out he's still alive. I thought he went off into oblivion and died, but he's alive. That's what we're celebrating to me. And if you want, you can go have a party anytime you want since this is all now yours. But today, my son's been returned to me. That's the kind of father that we're dealing with. I had the privilege to talk to a family and they were a little worried about their, uh, the father was worried about his son that had kind of lived an interesting life. And I use this very, the story of the prodigal son to talk about that. But obviously God is not like us, looking for rules to disqualify people. But God is looking for that person to, to turn their head towards him, to, to start walking towards him. And, 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 and this, his father, who probably was from a more traditional uh, religious background, was absolutely shocked at this thought. That if, and, I, and I finished it up by talking about how the, it says, there's a verse in Matthew where it says, if you, being evil, know how to give your children good gifts, how much more so your heavenly father. And in other words, if you as a father feel compassion to your children, no matter where they are in life, and you still love them, then how much more so the, the, the heavenly father who all fatherhood is based on. Think about that. He's merciful. We are merciful to our children. And, and yet we're shocked that God is, is as well. We're shocked. We may not be merciful to other people, but many people are merciful to their family and to their children. And so is God. 
And, and no wonder we're all God's children. So God has to be merciful and give grace to his children. read a story about Spurgeon. And in Spurgeon, uh, it was his birthday. And he thought he deserved some special treatment. And he was laying in his bed. And his father said, I need you to come out here and hoe this garden. And he told him, no, it's my birthday. I'm not doing that. And he said he'd never seen his father move that fast. And he said, uh, he said he's like, just getting, he felt like he just got that last word out. And suddenly his father was in his bedroom giving him a good swat and you know what he did he went out and he worked that garden till after dark but afterwards his father had him go get in the truck and he took him into town to go eat and gave him a special birthday dinner and he, Spurgeon says that was his first encounter with grace that while he didn't deserve it for how he spoke to his dad his dad had, had grace upon him and took him in to go get something to eat. He didn't forget that it was his birthday. We're going to finish up by going back into Romans. And I, and I, told, I told you that, that Romans is a good verse, a good set of verses, uh, because Paul is dealing with the Romans on this concept of grace. So uh, as we talked before, the Romans were a very law-like people. They, they were running an entire empire, and so there were laws and, 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 a, and a procedure to everything. So Paul deals with them by talking to them about the law and talking to them about the difference between the law and grace. Because this would have been a foreign concept to the Romans, that, 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 you could, that, that somebody would extend mercy to you. Because to run an empire, you have to have order. And, and, and what do laws impose? They impose order. And so they were very strict about what they did. They were very strict about not having compassion. But Paul begins to speak with them as a fellow Roman. And, and he, he talks with them. And, and, and I feel like most of his argument is summed up here in Romans 5. It says, and there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Paul wants, to understand, wants them to understand that people deserve, by the things that they commit, a certain punishment. He understands that. Paul's saying, I get it. He said, you know, even the law of the universe is that people deserve a certain punishment. But God didn't like that. And just like Mayor LaGuardia, he went and paid the, the, the fine himself. He, he, Jesus came and he paid that fine that we had incurred. He, he, he said, I'll pay for it. Because that's who he is. And then he said, not only that, but I'm going to make you receptacle of my goodness, my grace. I'm going to pour it in you. you you'll be, a, you'll be a, a holding vessel of who I am through the Holy Spirit. And he said, and when you're a holding vessel of who I am, you'll begin to look like me. You'll begin to, you'll be to the world. You'll start to go out and you'll start having mercy, grace, compassion on others. Grace is hard. Because we like discipline. We, we think that there should be a charge for a crime. Don't we? We feel like there needs to be something happen. But what does grace do? Grace says, listen, 
I know you messed up. But I forgive you. And here's a sandwich. And we don't like it. Everybody that's not getting it hates it. Because we want them to be punished. Because almost every one of us go back to that event where we were punished for something. But we... but. And it's dangerous because, you know, we don't know what will happen. You know, it, it's out there on a ledge. It's just like us, but just like us with the Father. You know, God forgives us, and then we don't do it ever again, right? Or do we? If you're like me, you find yourself falling into similar, pot, uh, similar potholes until you finally have used, have, have gained enough of God that you start to avoid those or you overcome those. And that's the difference of grace. And, and what is, <laughs> and, and yet God tells us, go and do likewise. We can accept that grace that he has given us, but we have trouble giving that grace out to other people. Give grace. Our worship team's gonna come up and they're gonna, they, they wanna sing one last song and then I've got a story to wind it up. And I'm going to have to sit over here and get my courage up because I don't like telling these type of stories. So, because um, they're about me. Um, so, <laughs> when I needed grace. And uh, so, if you would just join us through singing. And, uh, yeah. Baby.
Brian, go back to my last slide, please. Or my title slide. Yep, perfect. So, last Sunday, I was went to um, Clainsboro to hear uh, to talk about this whole thing on uh, June 9th, the Family Fun Day. Then I went to see uh, Brother Larry, that's in the hospital or in the uh, nursing home, and I'm heading home. And I don't know if many of you know this, but I got that new car about a couple months ago, and it tends to get out from underneath you. And oh, I no. turned out I was driving a little bit faster than what I thought I was. <laughs> um, and, and you know when you know that when you when you when you meet a police officer coming the other way, and uh, he turned on his lights, pulled me over, and I knew I was I was I knew he had me dead to rights. See, like you all, I, you know, many years ago when I was 16, I went and took a course to teach me how to drive. And one of the things that I, I promised on a line with my name was that I would drive the speed limit, that I would, uh, you know, obey all the rules of the road. Um, and, and, you know, they have you, every once in a while, they have you come recommit to that. And uh, he pulls me over. I knew he had me dead to rights. <sighs> he comes up there and it's someone I know, um, <laughs> Great. Which, which makes it all the better. <laughs> and he tells me, he says, let me see your license. And I said, okay. And he goes, uh, you going a little faster, huh, chief? And I said, yep. And he said, let me go run your license and then I'll be right back. So he, he did that, exactly that. And he says, uh, what, what does he say when he comes back? You know, he's ha he has me at a major disadvantage. Um, and he goes, slow it down there, huh? And I said, yep, I'll do better. And he goes, have a good day, John. And, and, he, and he drives off. And, and, uh, and, and you know what? Here's the thing. If I, if I had that incident and I just go speeding along from there on, you know, just one of them things like, oh, I can't help my left foot, you know what it is. Um, then I'm cheapening the grace that I was just given. Because if I get pulled over again, they're going to see that he let me off. And they're going to look at that and they're going to say, this man is a fool. Obviously, this is a scofflaw. He, he, he doesn't know how to not drive fast. So I owe it to him to live in the grace that he gave me. And I'm hoping your, your minds are going not just about a police officer, but you're thinking about the Father. That when, we, that when we too, and that's where this whole message came from, was this interaction. When we too receive forgiveness from the Father, you know that feeling when all of a sudden everything gets lighter in here? When you confess your sins to Him and let Him know that you did wrong and, and He gets all lighter here? But if we too run back to the very same things that he's given us forgiveness about, it cheapens the grace that had to be bought for us. Mm -hmm. Don't cheapen it. That grace cost the father something. He had to watch his son on the cross in, in severe agony for that grace to be able to be purchased. It's not worth it for momentary pleasures. Stay with me. Father God, we thank you for your grace, that grace that we need. We know who we are. And Father, we know, as, as Nate Up Church used to say, that we fail you again and again. But Father, that grace is what allows us to get to become more like you. It, it allows us to cast off the, thing, the sins that so easy beset and, and, and that tend to plague us. And so, Father, we, we just thank you again and again for that grace that allows us to go forward. I thank you for each and every one here, that through your grace they were saved, that through your grace they're becoming more like you, that through your grace we're beginning to look like you to the communities that each of us represent, that when they see us, they say they belong to the Father because you can see the grace that pours out of their life towards others. Thank you for loving us, for making us the head and not the tails, above and not beneath. 
blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Mm -hmm. Blessed going out and blessed coming in. That's called grace. That's your grace that you do that for us. And I just ask that, you, that each one here would walk in that grace, that, that, that purchased power that we didn't deserve. As we go into this next week, let us be your vision, a vision of you to others that meet us. Let us be that living word, that living Bible that people get to, get to interact with. Thank you for your love and thank you for bringing us here safely. I ask you to go with us, lead us, guide us, and direct us in all of our paths. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.